today I'm going to be discussing the representation of Igbo culture in Things Fall Apart. Uh, there's a lot of it, so I decided to just pick some things that I had questions about and that I was interested in throughout the story. And so that's what I chose to focus on, just because there's so much that we'd be here all day if I discussed everything. Um, so I'm going to give a little background first. And just to refresh everybody's brain and then talk about the other things. Um, the novel was published in 1958 uh, by Chinua Achebe, I think I said that right, um, just two years before Nigeria achieved its independence from British. Um, the title comes from, ironically, of European thought a poem called The Second Coming by W.B. Yeats that we talked about in the last class. And um, the poem discusses an internal flow in humanity, and that is also what Things Fall Apart discusses. So that's why the name is what it is. Yeah. And uh, in Things Fall Apart, Achebe illustrates this vision by explaining what happened to the Igbo society whenever uh, the Christian missionaries came in and tried to put their uh, ideas and beliefs on the Igbo people instead of trying to work with them and uh, learn about their culture. Um, because of internal weaknesses within the native structure and the divided nature of the Igbo society. Uh, the community of Eumophia, in, I think that's how you say it, in this novel um, ends up not being able to withstand all of these trials and tribulations that it's put through. Um, also, Achebe wanted to write this novel because of all of the Europeans and the white men that were writing about African culture at this time. They were very, they stereotyped the Africans. Um, they made them out to be evil. Um, they didn't really explain their culture. They just sort of said something and then moved on from it briefly instead of explaining it. And so this, we saw that a lot in Joseph Conrad's novel, Heart of Darkness, that we read. And that was one of the ones that really triggered him to write this because he wanted people to see the Igbo culture and the African culture from their perspective instead of the white man's perspective because he wanted to show that they're not all evil. They have reasons for doing the things that they do and traditions that they do just like every other culture. Um, Igbo culture is exhibited largely throughout this novel, um, both the good and the bad. He doesn't just show the good qualities of it. He shows the negative aspects of it too, and that's what's kind of unique about this novel. And he also doesn't just oppress the white uh, missionaries in the novel. He, he, doesn't stere he doesn't necessarily stereotype them. He really tries to give like a fair representation of everybody in the novel, and that's kind of what's unique about it. But um, in the first chapter, right off the bat, we are introduced to several aspects of Igbo culture. One of the first aspects of Igbo culture that we are introduced to is the social rituals that they have. Um, for example, when Okoye came to visit Yunoka in the first chapter to talk to him about the unpaid debt that he has, um, and asked for his money. The first thing that he did was Rose shook his hand. Um, they went and got the cola nut. Is that how you pronounce it? The mm -hmm. cola nut. And some alligator pepper and a lump of white chalk. And instead of lashing out at uh, Yunoka about the unpaid debt right away, they do this social ritual um, and share a cola nut. They give thanks to the ancestors and then went on to discuss the debt afterwards. Um, the ritual of offering and breaking the cola nut uh, is very important to the Igbo culture. Um, it is, here Yunoka is uh, being a good host to his guests 
by bringing the colon up for him to break. Um, there is an entire system of etiquette and routine that the Igbo culture does uh, that goes along with the breaking and eating of colon up, and the privilege of breaking it is a great honor for the person who gets to do it. That's why they kind of go back and forth about who gets to break it in the first chapter, just to clear that up. Um, and the whole thing is kind of like a sacred communion that happens before any matter of business can really be discussed. Um, and the respect for this custom kind of translates into the respect for one another. It's just kind of a, shot, a side of respect for the elders and uh, the guests that come to people's homes. Um, and that is the importance of the colonel, in case anybody was wondering, because they mention it several times throughout the novel. So I just wanted to talk about that. And this is actually a colonel. And then this is somebody offering one to another man. Um, also in Igbo culture, it is a tradition that every man uh, or child, boy, begins his life as an apprentice to his father or some kind of um, male family member, elderly male family member like an uncle. Um, the young boys accompany this figure to the farm and they kind of apprentice or internship under them and learn all about how to do the yams and how to have a farm basically um, and offer as much assistance as they can while learning about the importance of farming. The son is supposed to, basically the son is supposed to assist the father on the farm and eventually, eventually the father is supposed to give the son a head start on uh, his own farm in the future by giving him starter seeds for yams. We see this in the novel whenever um, a, a kind of a couple, I can't say these names, so I apologize. <laughs> the main character goes to uh, one of his friends and an elderly man and gets the starter seeds for his own farm and he gives him twice the amount he's supposed to get. Um, uh, and we all know, or I hope that we, it's evident y'all that the yam is a very sacred crop in Igbo culture. It's very important. Um, and it gives him a barn to start, uh, to store all of this in. However, a Akonkwa was not given this head start in life that most men are given, which is kind of, when I researched this, it started making a lot of sense why he's so angry towards his father and works so hard. Um, it doesn't make up for the way he acts, uh, but it just gives you some insight on why he's so angry towards him because other people around him are getting a head start and getting help. His father didn't leave him with anything, so that makes sense. Um, and this is also why he has his son in way, I think maybe that's how you say it, um, with him, helping him farm all the time, too. It's trying to get him to apprenticeship under him, so eventually he can pass these things on to him. However, we know that he's not going to, if he read the novel. Um, another very important aspect of Igbo culture that I really kind of wondered about was personal achievement and titles. Um, it's very obvious that personal achievement is very important if you read the novel at all to the Igbo people. They don't really care about other things. They just care about what, like your family what your family's on, they don't really care about that. They care about what you do. So, um, by Conquo defeating the cat in the wrestling match, that builds up his personal achievement, and that's why people think so highly of him. And then he also builds his farm from nothing, um, from scratch, and works very hard, and that is something that the Igbo people really value more than anything. Um, from what I found through a lot of research. Um, and also they really value the idea of titles, which is another thing I really wondered about in the story. Um, Akonkwo has two titles, I believe. Um, but what I learned after researching about the titles is that it's not easy to get these titles 
for the everyday person. They're really, really expensive, and each title, as they go up, costs more and more and more. So a lot of people can't really get past the first title, and they also have to pay initiation fees just to get the, to keep the title. Um, so it's just very costly, um, and not many people can afford them. So. Um, it's a very unique system of honor, honorific uh, titles, and it's kind of their way to compare themselves with one another in society, in a way. Um, as men acquire more wealth, they may gain additional recognition and prestige by taking a higher title. Um, and the highest title, which is mentioned in the novel some at some point, and I can't remember when, is the Ozo title. I think I said that right. Um, to qualify for this title, a man has to have acquired all the other titles um, and accumulated enough wealth because it's very, very expensive. Um, also, no man can obtain a status that is equal or exceeds his own father's status um, if his father is still alive. That's what I found when I researched. So um, that's kind of interesting. Um, but however, like I said, many men don't make it past the first title just because of how expensive it is. Um, we see how important titles are throughout the novel. It's, it's very important. That's another reason why Kongo is so angry with, about his own father is because he didn't have a title. And somebody referred to his father as an Agbala when he was a child, which essentially means a uh, woman. But it also refers to a man with no titles. I saw that a lot come up in the research whenever I was researching. Um, and learning more about the overall importance of titles just really opened my eyes to why he was so angry towards his father. It, they just really mean a lot to the people in Igbo society. And it also opened my eyes to why Okonkwo was so upset whenever he was exiled because he really wanted to get more titles because he was planning to be admitted into the Council of Chiefs, which is what people tend to do when as they get more titles, is eventually go into the Council of Chiefs, which is very prestigious. Um, also, I want to talk about social and political structures in the novel because they touched on it, but it wasn't really explained, I don't feel like. Um, so, uh, the Igbo society ultimately lacked a centralized political structure overall. Um, the Igbo lived in separate villages. We see this throughout the novel. Um, and towns which were actually ruled by the elders and not some form of like government I guess. The elders made the decisions for the most part and ruled. Um, each village arranged itself into these lineage groups which was like through bloodline I believe and it's passed down. Uh, it's based solely on age. So we see this in a Conquo's household. He is the head man of his household and he rules and it goes from father to son basically. Um, so that is just an important aspect that I wanted to talk about and clear up because I was a little bit unsure of it. But this is actually how Igbo culture works. Uh, another thing I want to discuss is marriage in Igbo culture. It's actually very important to their culture. Um, it's mentioned in the novel uh, in chapter 8 when Oberika's daughter is planning to get married and he, he mentions about meeting with the parents and also the groom or future husband um, to discuss a bride price which I believe from research is like a sacrifice kind of thing, like the palm, like giving them palm wine, not really a sacrifice, but like a, in a way, kind of, like giving them something in return for the girl, basically, like some palm wine, a cola nut, just like 
piles of things in order to get the one. Um, in the in chapter eight, he mentions to Akonkwa that his daughter Sugar will be visiting, and he hopes that he can agree on a bride price. Um, in Igbo culture, traditional marriage is not just between the the woman and the man that are planning to get married. It's between the immediate family as well as the lineage groups that I mentioned and the villages. They're all involved. It's not just a two-person thing. Just to clear that up. Um, it is an actual process. It takes time. You have to have a meeting to settle the bride price. You have to then have another meeting to make the payment for the bride price. Then you have to plan the actual wedding. Then there's a huge ceremony in the wedding with palm wine where the boy get, or the groom gets the palm wine and I think takes it to the parents or something of that sort. Cola nut, uh, the women in the village prepare, help prepare a feast, um, and it is a large, long process kind of thing. Um, and it's a big deal, and I researched and learned why it's such a big deal, and now it makes sense. Um, the men in Igbo practice poly polygamy throughout this novel, obviously. Uh, they have more than one wife, and the reason for this is because uh, the bigger the family, the more you can produce agriculturally, and um, agriculture and how you're farming kind of is actually like a large indicator of how much wealth you have in Igbo society. So the other women actually want the man to have more than one wife. and. More children means more people to help do the labor on the farm. So, uh, a lot of people are kind of judgmental about this, but in a way, not that it's right, but it makes sense now that I've learned more about it, um, why they do what they do. It, it help, more wives means more wealth, basically, is what I got out of it. Um, The next thing I'm going to talk about is religion. Um, throughout the novel, we learned a little bit about Igbo religion in some of the later chapters, which is in fact, I found some way a little bit similar to Christianity. They have one supreme being that they believe in, Chuck Wu, I think that's how you say it. Um, but they also have other divinities and spirits that they um, connect with in order to connect with Chukwu, I believe that's correct. Um, we see that in the story a lot. They are very spiritual. Um, they believe that this supreme being lived in the sky and that he was the creator of all things and directed all events. And they believe that he can be reached through other divinities and spirits in the form of natural objects. That's why I have this um, picture of the carved wooden statue. Uh, they use things like this to put a spirit in or implant a spirit in through a priest, I believe, or, and then they would pray to it and use it for religious purposes. Um, also, they strongly, strongly believe that ancestors were, that were dead were a large part of their will, welfare and their well-being, that they played a large role in it. And we see that a lot in the novel also. Um, they believe that after an elder died, they didn't just go away. Um, they, their spirits were still here, um, and they lurked in the shadows and were unseen, looking after the welfare of the li living members of their lineage groups. And the village, the belief is why the tradition of the Kolina and thanking the ancestors is so important, actually, the one that I mentioned from chapter one. Um, that's why they thank the ancestors so much. Um, also, another thing that was brought up in the novel that we kind of talked about, I believe, last class period was the Agbanji. Is that how you say it? Close enough. Um, we see this term when the author is discussing Azima, uh, a conquest favorite daughter. Um, in Igbo culture, people believe that babies could be reincarnated after death. However, these babies typically abuse 
their parents and cause them a great a deal of unnecessary pain. Um, they would die and then come back multiple times. We see this with Azima's mother. She's buried nine out of ten of her own children, I believe. Um, the babies would die soon after birth and they would just repeat the cycle. Um, and another thing that I wanted to discuss is the term of uh, the, the chi they talked about in the novel um, to clear it up a little bit. This term is brought up a couple times and someone explained briefly but not fully in depth. Uh, a chi is kind of like a personal god for a person. Um, you can kind of compare it to a guardian angel in a way for Christians, like the concept of a guardian angel maybe. Um, a person's chi follows them throughout their lifetime and can be either good or evil. And typically a person with a good chi was successful in majority of their endeavors while a person with a bad uh, chi had unfortunate happenings again and again and again. Um, that was their belief. But they didn't believe that the chi was the final, or like depicted your final destiny overall. But they did believe in the bad chi and the good chi, if that makes sense. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the twins, because this really hurt my feelings whenever we read the novel. Um, the reason that they threw, threw away the twin babies or got rid of them is because in Igbo society they believed that there was something unusual, supernatural, abnormal, and overall evil about twins. They thought that they were a sign of the worth of the devil because um, they would pray for kids and then when they would get more than what, or for a kid, and then when they got more than what they asked for, they, they didn't think that that was good. They thought that that was not, a, that it was the work of the devil. So um, that's why they did the things that they did. They believed that they needed to kill and sacrifice the twins as peace offerings, um, actually. Uh, this is something that's brought up multiple times throughout the novel. Uh, we see it, uh, as part of the reason why Emoy uh, chooses to convert, I believe, to Christianity. It's because he can't really grasp this concept and the Igbo people don't, they're not proud of this from what I read like now, but this is just something, this was just uh, an aspect of the culture back then, something that they believed in. And the final thing I'm going to talk about is just one of the traditions that they have or holidays that they discuss in the novel. Uh, the Week of Peace, it is a very important holiday in Igbo culture that is celebrated each year. It is considered to be the week before the yams are planted each year. Um, and it is sort of a union for the Igbo people and like a way to appease the gods to get, uh, to have good crops for them. And during this week, there's supposed to be no work, no physical abuse, no harmful words, nothing bad, pretty much, basically, to sum it all up. And that's why it's such like a such a big deal whenever a conqueror beats his wife in earlier in the story, and they're so angry with him. They're not angry with him because he beat his wife. That was honestly socially acceptable. They were mad because he did it during the week of peace, which is a big deal to them. Um, uh, they do this ceremony or they celebrate this holiday in order to honor the earth goddess that we hear about in the novel Ani, I think that's how you say her name. Uh, by doing this she is thought to bless the crops so that they will have a good harvest year. Uh, this is a major holiday in Igbo culture and Okay. Great. Thank you, Lindsay.
just to, um, come on, you turn off now. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Okay, just to uh, elaborate a little bit on uh, what Lindsay said about um, practices regarding uh, twins, because this is the part of the novel that Western readers who are unfamiliar with this custom often find most upsetting, right? Um, what twins represented for the Igbo was excessive. Yeah, it's a, yeah, essentially you're you're getting too much at once. And that's a bad sign, right? It's an omen that bad things are to come. Yeah. And so the way they would typically deal with it this is the same way actually that the ancient Greeks and Romans uh, dealt with unwanted children. Um, they would take them and leave them out in the forest and kind of let nature take its course that way. Um, as a kind of you know, offering to appease the earth gods, right? If you're taking excessive fertility, means you're taking too much from the earth, and so you have to give it back. Um, in fact, much of what they talk about, you're like a lot of the offenses that are committed, right, are offenses against the earth, offenses against the land, right? If we look at um, Unoka, um, Okongo's father's death. Right? He has that swelling sickness. That is regarded as offensive to the earth. And so he can't be buried with the normal rites. Right? He can't be buried like a normal person. He has to be taken out into the evil forest and left there. Because to bury him in, which means he doesn't then join the ancestor spirits. Okonkwo's own death, right, death by suicide is considered an offense against the earth. So Okonkwo meets, in the end, the same fate as his father. Right, because he's a suicide, his body also, his body can only be handled by strangers. No one from the village can touch it and has to be taken out to the evil forest. So both he and his father are then kind of taken out of the tribal lineage. But one other thing, and you sort of started talking about this um, in terms of um, titles and whatnot. Um, I want to point briefly to a passage. Um, it's on page 148, it was in the version that I was at the beginning of chapter 17. The missionaries spent their first four or five nights in the marketplace and went into the village each morning to preach, uh, to preach the gospel. They asked who the king of the village was, but the villagers told them that there was no king. We have men of high title and the chief priests and the elders, they said. So one thing that this points out is that while British society, right, the society of the colonizers is hierarchical, Right? Right? There's a queen at the top, and everybody else obeys the queen, right, and levels downward, right? Just as the, the district commissioner is the queen's representative in this region. And the messengers, right, the cotton, the the court messengers, the Kotma, or Ashi buttocks, right? They're supposed to be then the district commissioner's representatives, right? So there's a definite hierarchy, there's a definite chain of command. Um, for the Igbo, things don't work that way. Igbo society is relatively egalitarian, at least in the sense that there is equality of opportunity. It would be considered 
a mark of disrespect to attain a higher title than your father while he's alive. But otherwise, your birth is not held against you, right? Some people will get a head start from inheriting seed yams and barns from their fathers. Others won't. But that doesn't mean that there's anything keeping those who don't inherit back from becoming leaders in the tribe, right? Hard work is valued. People who are willing to work themselves up from little or nothing um, are highly respected. So anybody, if they put in the time and the effort, can take the titles, right? Even if your father was a man with no titles, like Unoka. Right? And this is one of the things, again, that you were mentioning sort of pisses Okonkwo off, right? Is that while Unoka's alive, Unoka is a man with no titles, which means Okonkwo can't take any titles either, not until his father is dead. And so Unoka slows him down in that sense as well. But yeah, otherwise, uh, yeah. We, we can also see, right, in various passages in the novel, um, decisions aren't made in a top-down way, right, where there's a village leader who tells everybody how things are going to be, right? All the men in the village get together and debate what's going to happen. And men with more titles are more highly respected, but everybody gets a voice in village affairs, right? And oratory is highly valued. Right, if we look at the next to last chapter, um, in which they're trying to decide what to do about you know, the recent imprisonments, right, the recent provocation against uh, you know, the six village elders who went to go talk to the district commissioner. When Okakwo and Obiarika got to the meeting place, there were already so many people that if one threw up a grain of sand, it would not find its way to the earth again. And many more people were coming from every quarter of the nine villages. It warmed Okakwo's heart to see such strength in numbers. But he was looking for one man in particular, the man whose tongue he dreaded and despised so much. Can you see him? He asked Obiarika. Who? Egonwane, he said, his eyes roving from one corner of the huge marketplace to the other. Most of the men sat on wooden stools they had brought with them. No, said Obiarika, casting his eyes over the crowd. Yes, there he is, under the silk cotton tree. Are you afraid he would convince us not to fight? Afraid? I do not care what he does to you. I despise him and those who listen to him. I shall fight alone if I choose. They spoke at the top of their voices, because everybody was talking. It was like the sound of a great market. I shall wait till he has spoken, Okonkwo thought, then I shall speak. But how do you know he will speak against war? Obiarika asked after a while. Because I know he is a coward, said Okonkwo. So if Igonwane is a coward, why does Okonkwo fear him in this instance? Isn't he older, the ego person? Well, the, does it actually tell us whether you're going to want to... This is the first time you're going to want to appear, right? Uh, what, what does Okonkwo fear from a Wane? What does Okonkwo want to do to get back in the district commissioner? War violence. Yeah. Like Okonkwo wants to fight back, right? Yeah. Okonkwo wants to drive the ashy buttocks and the British out of Umofia, right? He wants them gone. What is he afraid Ibn Wane will do? To conform. Is he afraid that Ibn Wane himself will conform? No, the whole village will have to conform. That he'll convince others to conform, right? Because Ibn Wane is a coward, but he is also a good speaker, right? Okonko fears his tongue. So someone who is a good speaker, who has the power to convince others, right? The most important skill for a leader in an egalitarian society, right, 
is consensus building, the ability to convince others. Does Okonkwo have that ability? No. Not so much, right? Okonkwo is physically brave and strong and is an incredibly hard worker, but he's stubborn, right? he's pig-headed, he's kind of selfish, and he often expresses disdain for the opinions of others, right? What the rest of the tribe wants to do is no matter to him. He'll do what he wants to do anyway. Right, so oratory is a highly valued skill, but one Okonkwo seems to lack, right? And we can actually, I think, compare this with Okonkwo's skill as a wrestler. Right, what does a good orator need to do? To understand the person that they're speaking to or group. Yeah, uh, they, they need some understanding of the beliefs and interests of the people they're speaking to. And they need to be able to sway those people over to their side, right? They need to be able to convince other people that what they propose is the best course of action. A wrestler, on the other hand, is merely trying to throw a single opponent, right? So an orator essentially works on, a, works on or in a group, right? Right, there is some struggle involved in the oratory, but the basic idea is to get everybody on the same page, right? To get everybody to agree with you. Wrestling is about individual struggle. This is what Okonkwo was good at. Right? Okonkwo is good at taking down an opponent. He's not good at fostering agreement among a group. In fact, he's often a disruptive element in groups that he's a part of. Because if he can't be convinced, then he just goes and does his own thing anyway, right? Yeah, Lindsay. Would you say this is kind of uh, shown in the scene where he uh, calls out the man with no titles for whenever they're in a meeting or something, and then everybody yeah. gets mad at him, kind of. Yeah, this is, this is the sort of thing he does, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, basically, you know, fuck you, I have more rings on my yeah, ankle than you have. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you, right, if, if you are, right, a man who takes no titles is a nobody, as far as he's concerned, right? Now, the, the word that is used in the novel for a foolish, or worthless person, right, is Efulefu. Right? And Efulefu is a person um, who the Igbo, right, so they're egalitarian, right, as we know, but they're also intensely meritocratic. Right? You get ahead by personal merit, right? And people who don't display personal merit whether through valor in combat or through, you know, <clears throat> you know, s successful farming, what have you, like building wealth, are people largely of no account. Mm -hmm. Now, unlike contemporary Americans, right, the Igbo won't let anybody starve just because they're not like they're not good at farming or they're not physically brave. And so, for example, like Unoka's friends keep loaning him money, even though they regard him as a worthless person, right? The community won't allow him to, to starve to death. But no one takes him seriously either. 
right? So I think what's important with these, with the FLFU, right? These, you know, quote unquote worthless people. How much stake do the FLFU have in society as it is? Mm -hmm. It's difficult to do that. Yeah, it requires a lot of effort yeah. to get title, right? It requires a lot of effort to become a person of importance in the society. So what were you going to say? I was just saying that they don't really have any importance in society or say so, really. Yeah, nobody takes them seriously, nobody pays any attention to them, right? So, who are the first converts to the new religion? Those the Efulefu, exactly, the people for whom the current social order is unsatisfactory, right? The people who are at the bottom the of the current social woman, order. I think with the twins. Yeah, she yeah. She, yeah, I mean, now her, she's actually a person that we're of relative wealth and status, uh, right? I didn't think of one. But she has a personal reason for wanting to join up with the grid. Essentially, you know, she keeps having twins. And she believes, you know, she's pregnant, she believes the odds are she's going to have twins again. In large part because in the Igbo belief system, right, we see things tend to repeat themselves. Right? We see Unoka's personality in Nwoye, right? And we see Okonkwo, despite the fact that he resents his father so much, repeating Unoka's shameful death. And this is another thing I just put uh, before I, I move on here. Um, one thing that the novel does, um, the elements of Igbo culture and belief that we would regard as superstitious, does the novel seem to regard those things as superstitious? Or does it more or less take the Igbo world at face value? Does the novel, for example, seem to behave as though there's no such thing as Ogbanji? Right, these changeling children that keep you know, dying and returning and dying and returning. Does the novel seem to think that these things are not real? or behave as though these things are not real. It's depicted like it is real. Yeah, I mean, in fact, you know, we, they have, you know, the, the shaman goes and digs up the stone, right? And says, is this your stone? And Mizinma says, yes. He destroys it. And as Igbo belief would have it, right, breaks the cycle, is in mistakes. Uh, similar incident when the, uh, when one of the Christians kills the sacred python, right? He sickens and dies soon afterwards. So, whether or not these things are actually connected to genuine supernatural activity, right? the novel being written from that 19th century Igbo perspective takes them seriously. Right? It takes the belief system seriously and depicts it as though, like, yes, this is what's this is what's really happening, right? And yet, at the same time, certain things that we expect would happen to the Christians, for example, when they build their church in the evil forest, right? What do the Igbo expect is going to happen? Why do they give them the evil forest? They're going to die. Yeah. Because so, that's what's happening. Yeah, it's like, okay, yeah, th this is, you know, this is our wasteland, right? This is where we dump trash. This is where we dump poisons. This is where we bury people um, who died shamefully, right? So they're going to get hounded out of there by evil spirits. But then they're not. And I think we have two incompatible belief systems that the novel... And the novel takes both seriously to an extent, right? Um, one thing to note about the 
Christians when they come is the way they communicate with the word, the language that they use, and the difficulty of translation. Um, if we look in uh, chapter uh, 16, it's on page 144 in my copy here. When they had all gathered, the white man began to speak to them. He spoke through an interpreter who was an Igbo man. Though his dialect was different and harsh to the ears of Mbanta, many people laughed at his dialect and the way he used words strangely. Instead of saying, myself, he always said, my buttocks. But he was a man of commanding presence, and the clansmen listened to him. He said he was one of them, as they could see from his color and his language. The other four black men were also their brothers, although one of them did not speak Igbo. The white man was also their brother, because they were all sons of God. And he told them about this new God, the creator of all the world and all the men and women. Note, right? <clears throat> So two things to note here, right? The my buttocks for myself and the inclusive modifier all. He told them they worshipped false gods, gods of wood and stone. A deep murmur went through the crowd when he said this. He told them that the true God lived on high and that all men, when they died, went before him for judgment. Evil men and all the heathen who in their blindness bowed to wood and stone were thrown into a fire that burned like palm oil. But good men who worship the true God lived forever in his happy kingdom. We have been sent by this great God to ask you to leave your wicked ways and false gods and turn to him so that you may be saved when you die, he said. Your buttocks understand our language, said someone lightheartedly, and the crowd laughed. Right. So initially the crowd doesn't take these guys seriously, right? In part because of a language barrier, right? This guy is from a different clan, his dialect is different, and so his word for myself is their word for my ass. Right. Right. Speaking for my ass. I almost brought that up in my presentation, <laughs> the language um, and also the proverbs. But I just yeah. didn't want it to be too long, so I put that yeah. out. <laughs> but that was funny to me. Uh -huh. Well, and that's the thing that draws Nwoye, right, is the stories. Right? We can see a parallel there between his love for his mother's stories in his childhood, and as an adult, he's drawn into the Christian fold by the Bible stories. Right? So storytelling seems to hold particularly great weight with him. Right? This is a new set of stories that he's not familiar with yet. But sort of to keep on with the, the, the language issue here, right? So <laughs> We have another instance where um, there's no direct translation for Holy Communion into the Igbo language. So they translate it as Holy Feast. Now, we've seen several feasts depicted in the novel, right? What does an Igbo feast look like? What do they do when they're preparing for a feast? They all come together, the whole the women, all the women and the, yeah. the tribe. They, it's like a community. Yeah. Thing. Everybody comes together, right? Everybody in the clan is invited. And they kill a couple of goats, right? They make enormous quantities of food. Right, and everybody stuffs themselves, right? Mm -hmm. It's a big deal. Like, you know, this is one of the ways, you know, a feast is one of the ways, you know, you do it for a wedding, you do it for initiation, right? It's one of the ways you gain titles, right? Is by spending money to throw big feasts. It's a way you show status. Now, how shocked then must an Igbo person be when they come to the holy feast <coughs> and they get a little wafer of bread, right? This probably seems particularly stingy. Right, the 
least, that's a concept they understand. Yes. <laughs> that's a concept that, that translates, right? But this community is, no, you're, you're just going to give me a little piece of bread and dip it in some wine. Like, no. <laughs> that's not a feast, right? What's wrong with you people? But at least, like, the first missionary who comes to Umofia, right, this Mr. Brown, makes an effort to understand. And this is part of what I'm getting at by talking about um, the all in the first missionary's language, right? He keeps talking about all men, right? Everyone, are, we're all brothers and sisters, and all people are judged by a God who created the whole world. Um, if we look at Mr. Brown's conversation with the village elder, whose name escapes me at the moment, um, Akuna. Right. Whenever Mr. Brown went to that village, he spent long hours with Akuna in his obi, talking through an interpreter about religion. Neither of them succeeded in converting the other, but they learned more about their different beliefs. Right. So. Mr. Brown is at least willing to learn about what the Igbo believe and what they do, right? You say that there is one supreme God who made heaven and earth, said Akuna, in one of Mr. Brown's visits. We also believe in him and call him Chukwu. He made all the world and the other gods. There are no other gods, said Mr. Brown. Chukwu is the only god and all others are false. So he does at least, he's at least clever enough to use the name the Igbo use for the supreme god, right? You carved a piece of wood like that one. He pointed at the rafters from which Akuna's carved a kanga hung, and you call it a god. But it is still a piece of wood. Yes, said Akuna. It is indeed a piece of wood. The tree from which it came was made by Chukwu, as indeed all minor gods were. But he made for them his messengers so that we could approach him through them. It is like yourself. You are the head of your church. No, protested Mr. Brown. The head of my church is God himself. I know, said Akuna. But there must be a head in this world among men. Somebody like yourself must be the head here. The head of my church in that sense is in England. That is exactly what I am saying. The head of your church is in your country. He has sent you here as his messenger. And you have also appointed your own messengers and servants. Or let me take another example, the district commissioner. He is sent by your king. They have a queen, said the interpreter on his own account. Your queen sends her messenger, the district commissioner. He finds that he cannot do the work alone, and so he appoints Kogma to help him. It is the same with God or Chukwu. He appoints the smaller gods to help him because his work is too great for one person. You should not think of him as a person, said Mr. Brown. It is because you do so that you imagine he must need helpers. And the worst thing about it is that you give all the worship to the false gods you have created. That is not so. We make sacrifices to the little gods. But when they fail and there is no one else to turn to, we go to Chukwu. It is right to do so. We approach a great man through his servants. But when his servants fail to help us, then we go to the last source of hope. We appear to pay greater attention to the little gods, but that is not so. We worry them more because we are afraid to worry their master. Our fathers knew that Chukwu was the overlord, and that is why many of them gave their children the name Chukwuka. Chukwu was supreme. You said, what interesting thing, said Mr. Brown. You are afraid of Chukwu. In my religion, Chukwu is a loving father and need not be feared by those who do his will. But we must fear him when we are not doing his will, said Akuna. And who is to tell his will? It is too great to be known. So on the one hand, the Igbo concept of Chukwu is a little bit more remote from humanity than the Christian concept of a personal god, right? Chukwu translates to, like the name Chukwu translates literally to something like, you know, he who can never be understood. Right. His motivations are considered beyond human understanding, which is why they, he is not approached directly. But otherwise, the Igbo religion is very much rooted in a specific spatial, environmental, geographical context, right? It's very much of that particular place, right? Their gods are located in various places all around them. 
right? They're attached to specific locations, specific shrines, right? This is the place where the god lives. They're made out of natural materials, you know, that are acquired locally and then, you know, blessed or, you know, sort of invested with spiritual power, right? So the Igbo religion is specific to this place. And, you know, they don't proselytize, they don't go out and try to convert other people to it, because it wouldn't make any sense, right? Other people who live in other places, obviously, worship whatever's appropriate for that place. Right? They're probably still doing Chukwu's will in some way, right? But they're approaching Chukwu through local means. Whereas, <clears throat> the Christian concept, right, is that all places in the eyes of God are essentially the same, right? They're promoting a kind of universalist practice, which seems fairly innocuous until we pair it with the practices of the district commissioner, right? One thing we have to remember is that the missionaries don't come alone. They come with merchants, yes, right? There's much more economic activity in the village. But they also come with soldiers and with bureaucrats. Now, would it be fair to say, given what we've read thus far of the novel, that the Igbo have, would it, um, would it be fair to say that the Igbo have no legal system of their own? No means of deciding disputes among themselves? No, they have um, a way. Yeah. Uh, that I read about mm -hmm. um, when I was researching the court system thing that they that whole scene where the yeah. the woman and the man and the bride probably stand exactly yeah yeah right yeah the, yeah, the, the, mm -hmm. yeah for, for irresolvable disputes right they bring people before the Igbo right they bring people before ancestor spirits and let the ancestor spirits decide the matter. Right, usually according to tradition. But we find um, you know, that a man has been killed, uh, a, man has been, a man has been hung by the district commissioner um, because the district commissioner didn't understand the practice over land disputes. And when Okonkwo and the other leaders are tricked by the district commissioner and imprisoned, right on page 194. Right? We shall not do you any harm, said the district commissioner to them later, if only you agree to cooperate with us. We have brought a peaceful administration to you and your people so that you may be happy. If any man ill treats you, we shall come to your rescue, but we will not allow you to, to ill treat others. We have a court of law where we judge cases and administer justice, just as is done in my country under a great queen. I have brought you here because you joined together to molest others, to burn people's houses and their place of worship. That must not happen in the dominion of our queen, the most powerful ruler in the world. I have decided that you will pay a fine of 200 bags of calories. You will be released as soon as you agree to this and undertake to collect that fine from your people. What do you say to that? So what assumption is buried in the district commissioner's statement to these men. What is he suggesting he has brought to them that they didn't have before? Peace. Peace. Peace and civility. And civility, yeah. But what's the instrument used for promoting peace and civility? Money and violence. Or bribery and violence. What does he say is the system that's used for promoting peace and civility? What has he brought these men to? A court of law, right? So he's suggesting that they didn't have any such thing before, right? Right. We have brought you law. We have brought you a peaceful administration, right? We want you to be happy, but you have to obey our laws, right? So there's this assumption 
that the Igbo didn't have any laws, right? That they just you know, sort of lived in, lived in pure anarchy until the British showed up and brought them rules. And we also see at the same time that the Kotma, the court messengers who enforce these rules, um, are corrupt, right? They increase the amount of the the amount of the fine to be paid by the village, so they can split the extra among themselves. So, I think it's also worth noting here that the district commissioner says that they brought peace. And this makes for an interesting comparison between the Igbo practice of warfare and the way the British do it. Um, Okonkwo, before he goes to that meeting, and he's got his war gear out, he's remembering a war against another, another town which Umofia were the victors, are on page 200, right? Worthy men are no more. Okako sighed as he remembered those days. The CK will never forget how we slaughtered them in that war. We killed 12 of their men, and they killed only two of ours. Before the end of the fourth market week, they were suing for peace. Those were days when men were men. And, you know, Okonkwo is a particularly good warrior in his early 40s when we first meet him. And by that point in his life, how many men has he killed? Does anybody remember? Five. five. He's killed, yes. He's an especially good warrior, and he's killed five men. So, overall, just how violent is Igbo warfare in terms of casualties? Not very violent, considering we're the district commissioner. Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's mostly ritualized, right? It's usually, you know, over, you know, resolving some dispute. Relatively few people die, and then everything sort of goes back to the way it was once peace is made, right? Now, when that white man shows up on his iron horse, freaks out the villagers in Abame, and they kill him, what's the British response? Kill everybody in the market. Yeah, destroy the whole village, right? So they claim to be bringing peace, but in fact, their way of making war is much more destructive. Their way of making war kills a lot more people than the Igbo way of making war does, right? So, the last thing I want to consider here, right? We talked a l uh, last time about the relationship between this novel and W.B. Yeats's batshit crazy philosophy of history, right? Does anyone remember how that worked? Yeah, go ahead, Lindsay. Um, it's talking about like when one culture mm -hmm. um, or a period of time ends and then another one comes in. Yeah. And it's completely different than the other one. I think that's how it goes. Uh, that's yeah. We have, right, these two spinning cones. that, you know, eventually one gives over to the other, right? Mm -hmm. One represents a subjective age in which things like personal heroism and individual human achievements are valued, and the other an objective age in which conformity, following the rules, and civilization building are valued, right? So, <clears throat> The coming of the Victorian British administration here, right, represents the coming of an objective age, supplanting the subjective age to which Okonkwo belongs, right? This is conscious on Achebe's part. That's why he's chosen a Yeats quote as his title. And it also relates to that, um, that play we talked about um, on Boya Strand, 
right, in which the hero, Cahalan, is shamed into killing his son, right? Or is, you know, tricked into killing his son by, you know, fear of being shamed. And then goes off and spends the rest of his energy battling the waves, right? Fighting, engaging in a useless fight that can't be won. And um, some critics have argued that there is, you know, that the structure of the novel mirrors on Billy Strand very closely, um, and that the waves that Oconquo fights are the district commissioner and the court messengers, right? That his killing of the court messenger, his insistence on fighting no matter what anybody else does, is Cahalan fighting the waves, right? Cahalan battling against the inevitable and the endless. But this all results in Oconquo's death. I just want to point to the last paragraph of the novel, and we'll sort of finish things up there. Right? The commissioner went away, taking three or four of the soldiers with him. In the many years in which he had toiled to bring civilization to different parts of Africa, he had learned a number of things. One of them was that a district commissioner must never attend excuse me, such undignified details as cutting a hanged man from the tree. Such attention would give the natives a poor opinion of him. So he has actually similar concerns to Oconquo's, right? He doesn't want to appear weak or womanish, you know, as one might put it, in front of these people he's supposed to rule. In the book which he planned to write, he would stress that point. As he walked back to the court, he thought about that book. Every day brought him some new material. The story of this man, who had killed a messenger and hanged himself, would make interesting reading. One could almost write a whole chapter on him. Perhaps not a whole chapter, but a reasonable paragraph at any rate. There was so much else to include, and one must be firm in cutting out details. He had already chosen the title of the book after much thought. The Pacification of the Primitive Tribes of the Lower Niger. So, in the district commissioner's conception of things, what's Okonkwo going to be reduced to? Paragraph. Yeah. This guy who worked all his life to build himself up from nothing and to become an important man in his tribe, right? To take as many titles as he could, you know, to marry wives and father children, to be a man of consequence, pneumophia, in the end, is a paragraph in a book written by a British man about the pacification, really the destruction of Okonkwo's whole way of life, right? That Okonkwo is just a small roadblock on the way to the pacification of the region. And this also points to like, the fact that he's going to end up in the district commissioner's book. Essentially, right, what the novel is, is Achebe writing back to these earlier ethnographic texts from the 19th and early 20th centuries, um, in which um, European writers made broad assertions about African cultures without providing specific examples, without sort of making them, you know, making them concrete in any way, and in which um, particular individuals were represented, if at all, as quaint curiosities. So here we have the fully fleshed out story of a man who would have only been a footnote in one of these books. And the destruction of the way of life that he knew drives him 
to homicide and then to suicide. Cheery stuff. Yay. Good times. All right, does anybody have any questions or anything else that they want to ask about or talk about before I let you guys go? Yeah, Brandon. Two questions. Yeah. One, um, did the Igbo culture really regain their culture after the after the Christianity thing? Did it really regain? Uh, well, and I, I think one thing we can't do, and one thing the novel kind of encourages us not to do, I think, is think of any particular culture as static, right? A culture is always changing, a culture is always in motion, right? In fact, that's one of the things that upsets Okonkwo when he comes back to Umofia, right? Is that he sees that, he sees that change in motion, right? One thing that I think Achebe is careful not to do is to show us um, a, an Igbo culture that is just fixed in a particular moment in time. So change would have occurred, change of some sort would have occurred anyway, right? But I mean, the Igbo are no longer um, an independent nation of their own, right? Um, sort of made up of villages, you know, towns and villages that run themselves. Rather, they have been incorporated into uh, the larger nation of Nigeria. They're one of the largest ethnic groups in Nigeria. Now, Nigeria itself is an art, you know, it's an artificially constructed nation, right? It's con constructed out of several other different pre-existing nations that speak different languages and have cultural differences, um, often insurmountable cultural differences, um, that basically just it represent, the, board, the current borders of Nigeria represent the sphere of British influence in that part of the Lower Niger region. Um, so yeah, I mean, Igbo culture is certainly different now and would have been different anyway had the British never come. Um, but yeah, um, there are people who follow certain